Uh, this is a Build OGM call for uh, October 5th, 2021. Uh, Jerry's uh, out for the first part of this call, so uh, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, we've started talking about a few different things. Right now, we're talking about Free Jerry's Brain. Um, and uh, so it's a little kind of subcommittee. Um, uh, one of the members has actually already said or has has observed that we we blew past the the small Dunbar number, um, and now it's uh, there's uh, too much uh, too much noise uh, for the amount of signal. Um, it was a very hyper focused small group, and we've kind of like accreted it and gotten a little bit bigger and fluffier. Um, not not a bad thing necessarily, but um, uh, but it, it actually there's an interesting tension um, in we have a uh, we have a private Mattermost channel which has got many of the members of the the original um, uh, group and not some of the people that have kind of joined so the the channel doesn't map the call very well anymore and I said maybe we should invite more of the people who come to the calls <laughs> to the channel um, so. So there's a tension between getting bigger and <coughs> doing more stuff and uh, having more stuff and having less focus. Um, small Dunbar number, I, I don't, actually don't know. I, Mark, it's a good question. Um, the, the person who wrote me privately and said we have already blew past it. Um, uh, as I understand it, Robin Dunbar, you know, the, the original Dunbar number is classically thought of as 150. It's actually... Um, uh, 150 plus or minus 50 is the way the original paper was written. Um, uh, and then recently on calls, I've been hearing people say, oh, oh, Robin Dunbar's new number is more like five or something like that. I don't know. Um, so I actually don't really know. It'd be interesting to, yay, Jerry is here. Um, it'd be interesting to, to figure that out. Certainly five is one of the classical numbers for effective software teams. Yeah. Yeah, there's the, yes, I agree. Um, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Ross Mayfield, used to have uh, three or four sizes of networks. One of them was, you know, three to seven or something like that, which is also the scrum number. Um, uh, uh, and close to the two pizza number um, from uh, Mr. Bezos. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, Ross's numbers were like, um, he had this, uh, he's got a great post, I'll have to dig it up. But the small number around five to seven, um, and then a larger number of 20 or something like that. And then the Dunbar number, the classical Dunbar number. And then he, uh, Ross actually likes uh, something he called, uh, I think political or something like that, which is thousands of people. Um, and those different sizes of networks are, are really important. Um, uh, and they, they work differently. Uh, but. Hey, Jerry. Hey there. Nice to see everybody. Thank you for, for um, shifting Zooms and, and so forth. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I just finished a pitch presentation that went really well. So very happy about that. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know that we've gotten super far. Um, we started talking about Free Jerry's Brain a little bit. So let me I came let me in finish. 10 minutes in, you should have solved everything. <laughs> I know, right? Um, <clears throat> there's a few tweets uh, here and there about the, the Facebook outage. And everyone is like, OK, Facebook is down for two or three hours. Let's fix democracy and, and get everybody vaccinated. That's Quick. great. <laughs> I love that. Um, uh, so, uh, um, uh, Klaus had an interesting question, uh, you know, by the way, I, I, I heard some of the, you know, stuff that the, the next evolution of Jerry's brain, um, and is, is that kind of like AI and helping it, having it help think and come up with ideas and stuff like that. And I said, that's one thing we've talked about. It's probably the smallest thing. Um, the, um, uh, the, the big effort is still free Jerry's brain. Um, Jerry's brain is held in proprietary software that's got a kind of a slow innovation curve. Um, and um, it would be nice if it were multiplayer and uh, less proprietary um, and more people playing. Uh, so Jerry likes to think of, he's got you know hundreds of thousands of, of nodes um, and 
Um, he thinks that would make great sourdough starter for a much bigger and grander kind of way of thinking about the world and connected knowledge and things like that. And uh, so the, the engineering folks in Free Jerry's brain, it's mostly engineering folks uh, with some UX and UI people, um, data, data science people. Um, hi, Mark, Antoine. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, we've we've cracked the code. It's uh, we've got the data out in a way that we feel comfortable that we're we're holding the data, um, and now we're you know wondering what to do. Um, we could have a hackathon um, or whatever around the idea of, um, hey, here's this big connected uh, knowledge graph. Uh, you know, what would you do with it? Um, another another option might be the one that I kind of suggested, a couple of people kind of suggested, and I honed it a little bit. It might be just to take uh, Jerry's use of the brain, which is kind of idiosyncratic in a good way. Um, uh, and, and it uses a subset of the whole, the brain um, capabilities, uh, but it uses it in a very productive way. Mm -hmm. Take just that and get some UX people to kind of replicate a, a design um, for that and then uh, have the data science people hook up the data that we've got to that front end. So anyway, the the long, you know, the the big, the the headline is try to make free free Jerry, or try to make Jerry's brain more open, more accessible, more usable, collaboratively by more people. Well, the, the reason I'm asking is there's this um, this uh, self learning software, right? Somebody developed an AI a, a core structure which uh, you can feed information to and it's, uh, it starts sorting the information and uh, making logical connections and then it's becoming actually intelligent. Yep. Um, and it's actually military grade because it's, it's now restricted access because it is yep. being used for nefarious reasons and probably yep. already out of the back anyhow. So I was just wondering if Jerry's brain is, um, if you are, if you are <clears throat> supposed to, or if you want to create the capacity to ask it the question, and it then knows where to go to, that is that is you know a specific algorithm. Um, and that you know, sounds like like a, a specific capacity of the software to to self learn. Does that make sense, or is that correct? Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, if, if I may, the, so you, you're describing something like GPT-3, maybe um, OpenAI and that kind of stuff. There's basically what it, uh, what those systems do um, is you throw it uh, way too much information, like all the information you can gather. Um, and uh, through a process of kind of trying to make connections and then self-evaluating how, how well the connections map the, the information that you've given it. Um, it can bootstrap up an understanding of the knowledge space that you've presented it. Um, so, so then you can do things um, like, uh, like a, a complete the sentence game is a, is a good way to think about it. Um, so, you know, um, apples have a color, the color is, you know, and the, the system would essentially kind of guess or remember that, hey, a bunch of people have talked about apples and colors, and whenever they do that, they end up talking about red. So it would fill in that sentence with red. Um, it can get a lot more sophisticated than that. That's a really simple example. Um, so GPT-3 now, um, uh, you can you can ask, another way to do that, it's, it's still the complete the sentence trick, but you can do it with questions too. So you can say, what is the meaning of life? And it will ramble on quite intelligently about, you know, what essentially it's remembering um, what it's found in a huge knowledge sphere. Um, so, uh, so certainly uh, you could take a pre, um, pre-trained model like GPT-3, um, uh, and whatever language models you want and knowledge models and stuff like that. And then uh, uh, it could also learn the connectivity that Jerry's got in his brain and then uh, do things like auto connect. Um, uh, so you could give it a new thing, like uh, here's a link about the Facebook outage uh, in 2021, October. Um, and it would say, I think these other things are related. Um, 
Uh, so it, you could probably ask something like that. What's the cause of the Facebook outage? And if it was connected up to enough Twitter and things like that, it would say it was a BGP error, um, uh, which is a pretty good guess at what the, the answer to that question is. You know, what, or what were the social ramifications of the Facebook outage? Well, you know, there were people who were disconnected in Latin America and people who couldn't use face, uh, WhatsApp and Instagram. Um, it's um, the, the whole AI thing is important to get into, to learn uh, about, um, and especially to get ahead of how we control it um, or not. Um, uh, the, the fear is kind of that I, we're not, AIs aren't going to take over the world like a sci-fi thing from 1950 or 1960. Um, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But the thing that's already happened um, is that humans and AIs are working together to manipulate things. Um, so actually Facebook, a lot of the reasons Facebook is bad is because they've got a bunch of AI driving people's dopamine cycles. Um, and thanks to the whistleblower whose name I can kind of imagine in my head, but not, I don't have it memorized yet, uh, KH. Um, uh, now we know that Facebook knows that the best way to get, or a very, very good way to get people's dopamine levels amped up and, and stuff like that is hate and, um, you know, things like that. So they've been purposely kind of driving society into hate mode, um, largely built on the fact that they can do AI. I, uh, I was, I was going to use a term of art I, against the human interactions. It is actually, uh, um, let me explain that. Uh, a lot of times you'll say against in a technical term, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using this algorithm against this data set and it, it's not, uh, it, it's not the English version of it. It's not, um, uh, oppositional oppositional or, or adversarial right um, but <laughs> uh, Facebook has actually been adversarial to human society and uh, nation states and and uh, humanity um, for you know for gain for profit um, the whistleblower is Francis Hogan um, you're welcome and I had to look her up I didn't remember her name off the top of my head either um, briefly I just want to build on she's, on she's a hero yeah totally a big time uh, hero um, and her logic on this is just great. And just the, the, the one sentence pull quote of, it turns out that Facebook has been, you know, choosing profit over like civilization while over fixing these problems over and over again. Uh, is like terrific. Uh, so a couple of things. Um, I've got a draft of a, uh, a challenge to come in and, and work on uh, Jerry's open brain, the thing that, that we sort of poured, we've exported my brain and it's kind of, it's available, but we haven't, it, we haven't pointed anybody to it. Uh, it has many different levels of challenge. So uh, at the top level is user experience, user interface. Like what does the next user interface look like, especially when I'm doing brain-like things, but someone else is doing Kumu-like things and someone else is doing other sorts of things. What does that look like? Let's, ex let's play, let's experiment. Somewhere in the middle is machine learning. And there's a dozen different ways that machine learning can be involved. And one of the reasons to get me out of the brain is that the brain has no API. There's no programming, no, there's no programming way to access what's in my brain. Um, so pouring it out and, and then saying, hey, machine learning people, A, I would love as I'm feeding my brain to have machine learning sitting by my side going, oh, 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 looks like that's a book. Do you, can, I, can I put the book and its author and the other books that she wrote in, in your brain? And I'd be like, yes, go. Because right now, everything you see in my brain, the 480,000 thoughts in it were all put in manually by me, which turns out is kind of time consuming. And if, if an AI were sitting, if a trustworthy AI that was just doing what I asked it to, not, I, I don't want it to go just absorb the world and put it in the brain because I need to know what's in my brain. That's great. Um, so the brain could also be watching when I meet somebody and it could go look at both of our brains and compare them and say, oh, it looks like you all agree on all these things. And then you disagree on these things. Would you like, to, would you like me to order a beer so that you can talk about the things you disagree with? Or uh, the brain could also infer a lot of things about me and then make uh, pretend to be me. So there's a, a bunch of sites that are growing up that'll create chat bots that you feed them all of your emails and all of any, any documents you created or speeches you gave, you feed them to this AI and then uh, once you're dead, it can simulate answering questions as if it was you, right? That's a possibility. There's, there's, so there's like 
uh, on lots of different things. And I think the key here is to go knock on the door of some of these machine learning, artificial intelligence communities and say, hey, would you like to play? And I met Danny Hillis years and years ago. He's part of the, the Deep Mind project at Google. That's, you know, there's a lot of different sort of avenues here to, to pursue. And I'm eager to get to the place where we can sort of even do that, uh, that invite. So sorry to go on long, but I'm ex very excited about that layer of possibilities um, with the brain as a seed for this kind of information. Any other thoughts on this or questions, Mark? I'm totally not interested in AI and um, I'm interested in IA. I'm interested in intelligence augmentation. Um, certainly, um, and, and for context, I've got a brain of, uh, 2 million nodes and 15 million connections that I've done since 84. Um, what strikes me, uh, and been thinking about this for a very long time, and what strikes me, the difference, and I have Jerry's data, and I've been looking at it, and I'm writing some, uh, basically, APIs to it. Um, uh, right now, I'm trying to suck it into um, a open source database, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, MySQL. And um, uh, Jerry, I don't know the privacy um, signature. The only, the only thing I'm concerned about, some thoughts are marked private, which is a, a field in there. The only thing I care about is that those fields be, though, though, any thought marked private be eliminated from the public database. That's any, everything else, like go, go crazy. I, I understand that I'm trying to figure out exactly what marks it private. So I've got to um, get into uh, this is a, a side conversation, yep. um, but uh, and it's a minority uh, of thoughts. It's way less than one percent of the thoughts are marked that way, and should just be one field. So it's just a matter of identifying that one field. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, um, there's a lot of story to AI um, rather than mm, actuality, and then certainly. Um, for the next part of the decade, I imagine that basically AI is something that you can think of as an amplifier, but it amplifies a particular signal. Um, I don't think it is a broadener, a a discoverer, a, a maker of connections. That that's particularly human, and I I, I continue to go back to um, our ur document of the um, uh, as we may think, and you know the computer does not make connections, but it can store them. Um, and the question is for me. I've done this individual work. Jerry's done this individual work. How do we move from individual work to social work? And that's not an easy transition. Um, that's, you know, I think of factor as something that's more, much more social than what I do. Um, and still um, there's, dozens if not hundreds of things like factor and i don't think we're studying them very closely or, or carefully how to make that different from facebook say different from you know dopamine hey there's dopamine's great but how does dopamine link to curiosity rather than social division that that i don't know how to answer Um, thank you, Mark. Um, I, I have a little bit of disagreement about AI making uh, creativity and connections, but um, uh, uh, um, I, I care more about humans than AIs. Um, the, the moving from individual work to social work is, is a really powerful um, way to, to put it. And I wanted to um, throw a caution flag. Um, one of the uh, one of the one of the things we have learned over a couple hundred years of capitalism um, 
is a kind of social work, but it's 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 ant like and stupid. Um, we have been we've gotten really good at scaling. Um, so Facebook is connecting many, 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 many people, but it's connecting them in in mostly not very sophisticated ways, um, in in ways where people can chatter and gossip. But Facebook never got good at creating um, change and growth and emotional intelligence among you know a lot of people. So that that social work that we need to figure out how to do better um, is not uh, 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever Facebook engineers building a system to make people as smart as ants. Um, we really need to figure out how to augment our human intelligence um, and be more emotionally intelligent and more thoughtful about the way that we work together in the world. So another another like take on that is, is political systems. Political systems theoretically are a way of scaling social work um, so that a nation is smarter and um, we could hope more humane and um, more thoughtful. Um, but if you look at the US right now, um, the political system that we've got doesn't really scale very well. It, I'm sure it worked a lot better than you know, than the town halls it replaced uh, in 1780 or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, it, we're, we're not scaling social work well at all. I would, I would judge at this point. And this is, that's why we face grand challenges um, the way that we do. I would argue that we are scaling social work, but it's something that has to be redesigned for, again, going back to the beginning of the call, many different network sizes um, and many different, I guess, temporal sizes, temporal yeah. scales. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly in this call, we can collaborate and we can all listen to each other and comment. Um, uh, certainly, I think, you know, the town hall works much, much better in a particular context than, say, um, you know, voting within a shire or county or, or something like that, you know, to get conversation and thinking happening rather than, you know, just get something in the mail, read it and say yes or no. Um, much different kind of context. Um, Klaus. Yeah, I was just thinking about social systems and, and, and the US. I mean, we are um, I think we're at a time right now where we are sort of regressing into raw uh, competitive instincts because you know, there is a, a shortage, a looming shortage of uh, resources, um, which requires a redistribution in some ways of social capital. Um, and when we, when we look around the world, you know, how uh, societies are dealing with using violence and, uh, and hierarchy, you know, to, to have the most predatory instincts dominate the social systems. You know, there are some societies that have succeeded in reining that in better than others. I mean, when you look at the European uh, cultures after killing each other off for a couple of thousand years and, and uh, you know, the throwing stuff at each other, they have sort of matured into uh, a form of governance that seems to be more equitable. But here in the United States, um, you know, we are really uh, sort of housing. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I mean, just this, this latest revelation about the, the uh, what is it, Pan, uh, Pandora's uh, project, right? Uh, I mean, it really highlights how, um, how people who are the most ruthless and the most reckless and the most disregarding the needs of social systems seem to come out on top of the pile. Yeah. And so how to, how to rein that in and, and uh, deal with it, particularly at a time right now where we are in an existential crisis because you know, we, we, are, we are absolutely destroying the ecosystem that supports us in, 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 the, in the process. So not being able to rein that in means uh, we, we are basically surrendering our future. 
So, so they, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, sort of rambling through the, 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 a couple of things here, but um, um, there is, there, there, yeah, I mean, to, to, to not be able to harness, you know, the direction that we move into as a society, reconnecting through the pyramids of, uh, of the economy, you know, particularly base of pyramid, uh, is going to be um, uh, a real a real challenge here. Michael. Yeah, um, this is I'm I'm uh, I'm veering back from what Klaus was saying to um, to some of the things that um, you and Pete and uh, Mark were talking about. Um, and and since you know Mark had mentioned factor and other things like it um, thought, you know, just, just wanting to speak on the differences between um, artificial intelligence, augmented human intelligence, machine learning. I think it, I think it's sort of, I'm, I'm sure there are people here who could find each of them very clearly, but they're, do seem to be fuzzy edges between a lot of things there. And the difference between um, human control and transparency of something that some people might call artificial intelligence um, and something that's in a black box are, you know, that that's huge. That that's bigger, that's a bigger difference within the realm of our artificial intelligence than whether we're talking about artificial intelligence or whether we're talking about machine learning, you know, and, and the thing that I would say that factor strives for is the ability and, and frankly, can't achieve until we have, you know, more technical expertise than we do um, is that like the black box algorithms that we suffer from in other places on other platforms, we want to put those simplified tools on the user's end to say, these are the criteria by which I want artificial intelligence or essentially a search or a saved search to work for me to say, you know, find me people to have who, whose ideas overlap with mine to have a beer with or something completely different that's your personal mission, but you are deciding what those criteria are instead of having to choose between the black box, you know, uh, algorithm or artificial intelligence on this platform or that platform or this tool or that tool. Why not? Uh, why not expose that to the user? Um, and I, I just, I feel like I don't hear that enough um, as, as a goal. It's just like, let's just put the controls in the hands of each user because people do have different needs. Anyway, that was the point I want to make. Love that, Michael, thank you. Mark Antoine? Yes, no, absolutely. The uh, A, I agree totally with Mark, what Mark said about humans have to be in charge. And I think we all agree with that. I mean, we're speaking about collective decision making, deliberative democracy, humans have to be imputable, and black box systems have no, no place there. That said, uh, one, one small thing I disagreed with that Mark said is that uh, AI is not good at finding new connections. Actually, AI is bloody good. It needs us to validate it, <laughs> absolutely. But it does find connections. Um, and having AI as part of the advising ecosystem, such that, again, in terms of transparency, you know that whatever decision a human has made has been informed by a specific AI algorithm, as Michael was describing, I think is a form of a valid form of transparency. We get advice from tons of people and tons of other agents at this point. That's the reality. Um, and, and, and I do think, however, that being aware of 
what were you informed of when making a certain decision? I think it's getting really uh, important. Like we have so many, the, the notion of democracy as opinion poll, as opposed to informed opinion poll, that was a distinction made by Fishkin in deliberative polling. And there's uh, other people in the uh, CDL, uh, the, uh, group I'm also part of who are talking about if we're doing um, if, if we're doing uh, sorry I got I'm, I'm getting something in parallel yes uh, if and I lost my track the, It'll come back to you when you stop thinking about it. Yes, of course. All uh, of your but, wishes will come true if you can just sit in a corner and not think of a white bear. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the, the basic point about, oh yeah, getting informed of what information was used to reach a decision, I think is now, and, and that way, uh, knowing whether the information is useful. Oh yeah, CDL people are looking at building a distributed Bayesian network of people's opinion about risk factors. But again, how informed was that uh, Bayesian network? And uh, in a Bayesian network, you take into account the existing and missing information, right? Um, so all this requires tracking what you've read, which I should be able to track what I've read. but. And we don't want that to be, become a tool of surveillance capitalism. But I need to know what I've read. Memex does that, for example. It has a track of your, uh, uh, that's the uh, kind of hypothesis alternative Memex. It has a track of what I've read. And how to do this without invading privacy, I don't know. I mean, we have the whole surveillance capitalism practice of tracking what you've done. But I think that being able to know how did you reach a decision is kind of important for you to take uh, information into account. That's a very, very, very tangential thought. But the, uh, and, and, and then we would know like you were using a fake AI, which can be valid, but can be misleading. So that would be part knows what. There's a, <clears throat> there's a bunch of really interesting thinking going on around cyborg or centaur people. And it goes back, Mark, to what you were saying about augmentation, which I think Doug Engelbart presented in 1968, a view of humans collaborating augmented by technology. And then Steve Jobs gives us personal computing and Bill Gates gave us personal computing and mostly rejected uh, collaboration in lots of different ways, made it really hard for collaboration to even actually show up. And so there's a lot of barriers in our way. But this whole notion of centaur and cyborg people kind of starts with chess. So when Deep Blue uh, beats Kasparov, uh, instead of like dying, you know, chess experts, instead of freaking out and, and trying to shut it down, they said, oh, this is cool. And they invented kind of freestyle chess where teams are allowed to use as much software and as many humans as they want. And then different teams form up. And it turns out that the combination of software and humans is better than just software by itself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are these centaurs, you know, half man, half horse or cyborg humans. And that's just gone, I think it's going crazy in lots of different places when we're trying to figure out uh, because our future is very likely a centaur future. Um, that, that we're, we're going, and, and I feel like I've got a little bit of a head start on this and, and mark you too with MX, but we have externalized tools that we treat as extensions of ourselves. They're, 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 the tools are so integrated into our everyday behavior that they are in fact extensions of our reach and our, and our grasp and our ability to, to manipulate and do things, which is, which is very centaur, as far as I can tell. Uh, now the tools are very primitive at this point and need improvement in the ways that we're talking about here. Uh, but I'm, just to go back to AI, I think AGI, artificial generalized intelligence is way far away. And the goal of having something that reasons like humans do in every area and has common sense is way far out there. I think those things are actually terrible goals for AI and machine learning. Um, but I think that piece by piece, machines are now able to do many things way better than humans. So, so basically we're gonna be pecked to death by ducks uh, in terms of our capacity to, to do things and show up in the world. Um, and I'm, I, for one, am kind of a fan of this, except that 
all the people in dark closets in, you know, around the world using this to, as malefactors, we, d we will never know how many of them there are, who they are and what they're doing. And that's really, really dangerous because a tool that given a small slice of activity can get better than humans at it. And your Facebook, you're trying to fight mis malinformation, right? Awesome. Well, GPT-3 now available you know, for free on the web, you can go use it or TensorFlow now available for free on the web can create mutations of messages that are close enough to being satire or something that you wouldn't want necessarily want to throw away and dismiss or mark and, and purge from the system. That's happening. So, so th there's this arms race going on between people who understand human psyche and social movements and are trying to sort of spin us all and people trying to create platforms that allow us to connect with each other. And uh, we're living through the, the rough part of it where we don't really understand how this plays out. And Michael, it's your responsibility to fix this. Uh, you've got the con. Um, I was just particularly gonna speak to the, um, the thing that you were mentioning at, at the beginning of what you just said about, um, let me see if I can bring myself back to it. Um, how well let, let me just let me just go jump to um second brain the second brain movement as a notion a general notion this is you know something shallower in most cases than what certainly that what you and mark are doing um but the idea that <clears throat> the goal for a collaborative intelligence is, you know, let's let's make it easy for all people to to do what they can do in a second brain context without thinking of themselves. I mean, you know, people would look at what either of you do and say, "That's not something I'm going to do. That's a lifestyle," you know, and <laughs> I'm not going there. But but you know, everybody has some stuff in Dropbox, you know, everybody has some stuff in, you know, they, they might have some stuff in Dropbox and some stuff in Pinterest and some stuff in, on their hard drive, you know, just like all different and some notes. And here's all this disparate stuff. I think the first step to, to viable collaborative intelligence is making that really easy to port into and ideally interoperably into things like factor and trove and you know whatever whatever other non ad supported tools there are um, you know not being after dopamine hits but rather being after a sense of focus and and like clarity and okay i've got my shit together and i know where to find it um, and, and do that in very minor ways that can grow over time. And then the relationships between our second brains are something that should be um, consensual and, and very um, like, you know, it, you want to put together your second brain on the subject of, um, of, I don't know, you know, climate change together with a different group with different criteria than you want to put your second brain about, um, you know, music and, um, and being able to, being able to just like at first do something as simple and basic and, and technically simple, you know, as saying, okay, I wanna share this collection of information that I've got in my second brain that regards music with this person who's also interested in music, um, but then get to the point where you're, you're doing something where the overlap there is, is able, you know, machine intelligence is able to go through and say, okay, you know, you have asked me to, to check in your group um, which people are into this kind of music and know this kind of music and therefore might be interested in this artist. Um, but for all of that to be, um, you know, tool controlled. 
Um, and I just think the problem with most collaboration tools is you have to collaborate and you have to collaborate with everybody who shares that tool with you in the same way. Um, and we need to be like dumber in, in our tool set and, and more interoperable, more, more basic to start with, just, you know, sort of pulling the tagging that people are doing um, and, and giving people control of that, I think. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but- um, You but, got really you know, close to solving the whole thing right there. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I do, I'm, I'm frustrated with where we, we've gotten to with Factor in that like, you know, there is, um, there is a, a uh, you know, co-founding, a technical co-founder <laughs> that is out there somewhere that is what, um, what we're missing uh, and, you know, that, that, that some of these things are within reach um, in, and, and on our roadmap, but, um, you know, haven't, haven't gotten there yet. And How close have you gotten to articulating that technical co-founder's mission or scope or goal? Oh, um, I mean, do you mean, do I have that, uh, that yes. job description in writing? I could, I don't, um, exactly. I'm interested in how you would phrase that and frame that because I think that that piece of the quest is important. And if we can get word out, maybe we can find that person for you. That's cool. I'm just saying. All right, if, yeah, if no, you, I, you, I if, appreciate if, that. And if you can articulate it, we, we've got a lot of networks. Then you could do some speed dating and figure out like what? If I can't build it, they will come. Exactly. We just need baseball players yeah. and a field and a cornfield. Right. Thanks, Michael. Thank uh, uh, are you done? Are you complete? Okay. Let's go, Mark Klaus, uh, Mark Antoine. Um, there's a difference between programs, progress in algorithms and AI and progress in data. Um, and they are mixed, um, certainly. Um, the revolution of data is what's driven um, current. Um, neural network types of pattern extraction and recognition. Um, when they do studies of the efficacy of certain algorithms um, matched against the efficacy of, of progress in data, data wins all the time. Um, so that's one uh, node I wanna highlight. The other is JCR Licklider. Um, who uh, came before Engelbart and inspired Engelbart and basically talked about human computer symbiosis and how humans and computers can think together in ways hitherto unimagined. Um, and there was one other thing, but I'll pass it to Klaus. Yeah, I'm, I'm always you know, thinking in how am I, how am I gonna use this stuff and, and uh, where, where do we, where do we go with it? So I just started an initiative with a group of NGOs focusing on the 2022 farm bill. And when you look at, so, and I'm working in partnership with uh, Finian from Kiss the Crown and Sierra Club and um, Soil for Crime. I mean, it's just a whole bunch of guys I got finally excited about, let's focus on, on this thing. It's the size of the defense bill. Most people don't have any idea what it does and what it is, but the outcomes of our farm bill policy are just horrendous, right? Uh, when you think about 80% of US farm, uh, of US medical bills are due to nutrition, you think about topsoil erosion, you think about social systems disturbed and so on and so on. So the, the, the issue, we have is that um, the political world is using data that is just simply wrong, right? I mean, or incomplete. Um, so, so where, and then when you get into a conversation, you instantly get into a bunch of arguments that derail, you know, the, the, the logic tree that you're trying to pursue. So there is no, there is no database, right, that is universally accepted as, as this is the right, the right information to use here, or uh, 
statistically, this is more right than that, right? I mean, you, you're looking for the uh, pathways of uh, most likely to succeed uh, options here. And that, that to me, you know, would be the most helpful thing to have in terms of augmented, uh, I really like the idea of augmented intelligence, um, because you would want to be able to go to a source uh, where you say, okay, soil carbon is being defined this way. And in order to get to that state of soil carbon, here's what you need to do. And this is universally accepted. It's science, it's evidence-based, you know, it's solid. And, and so that, because we, we are still making decisions where one partner in the decision-making process will just simply deny, you know, or come up with something completely different. And then, uh, then you stand, then you are, you know, in, an, in a no-win uh, discussion leading to the next bad decision. So, so that's, so that, that's sort of where, where, what I'm looking for, you know, is, is, how do you how do you get to data or how do you summarize data? So so one thing I'm working on right now uh, is to develop a communications tool uh, that is directed at environmentalists to help them understand why they need to focus on the farm bill. Because I, you, know, you, you can talk to the water sentinels or the anti-grazers or the vegans and what have you, and they all live in a different bucket. Uh, without seeing the system that they are that they are uh, working within, and so to elevate the discussion where you each have a place within this discussion, but it's a bigger conversation that we need to put some structure around. That's a, so, so that's sort of where, where I'm where I'm looking uh, at, at uh, working with data. Klaus, it's exciting that you're you're working with other people on the farm bill. I would love to be closer to that. Um, I think that the farm bill is really important, like you do, <clears throat> and I want to see if how weaving the world could be helpful, and other you know other pieces of this fit into what you're trying to do there. So let's let's come back to that. Um, and are you still doing the Tuesday uh, CFS calls? No, because I'm sh I shifted course. I just I was offered uh, a partnership with um with forest and it's the uh, um it's the planetary care group and in fact i'm doing an onboarding call this week with them so um so i will join and that's a significant uh, group that just got more than a million dollars in funding um focused on building you know the community based food systems but interestingly enough i went through several interviews uh, with them um, their uh, idea of uh, assigning value to me as a partner is that I'm so well connected with people who can help, <laughs> and and, uh, and that's really true, right? Because uh, uh, this requires a lot of deep thinking uh, to to set up the process structures that will they they want to scale. I mean, they they are ready to to hit the ground and and scale this thing. Um, so, so we may, I mean, I would love to revive the, the conversations if I knew how, what to focus them on. I mean, the farm bill would be one fantastic thing to focus on because, you know, it embeds the entire pathology within our system. Also interesting because I'm also connected with the United Nations. I'm, a, I'm on the advisory board there. The United Nations has just, I mean, the U.S. has just made a decision to separate from the, EU, from the EU farm strategy. The EU is going after farm to fork of, of community food systems. And the, United, the, the US has decided to instead partner with Brazil and of all places, the United Arab Emirates, you know, to maintain basic, well, to maintain commodity crops because the EU wants to get out of commodity crops, out of monocropping practices. Yeah, and, and, wow. and yeah, it's, it's a it's a big uh, change in, in direction, which is also one reason why the French are the most hated people in the American farm community right now because they they created the four per thousand initiative. But the United the, the the political pressure on the U.S. government by these uh, the, the multinational food companies is too strong, right? So even Vilsack has all the best intentions. 
they have to buy, they have to announce uh, support for this uh, continued monocropping strategy. Um, so, so uh, yeah, this is this is a big foot fight, predictably so, right? Because the if if the, the European uh, Union strategy implies billions of dollars in stranded assets to the multinational food company. I mean, I, I could spend some time explaining the technical reasons for this, but you know, you have uh, uh, this this massive corporate structure going from Monsanto buyer, you know, to McDonald's and, and everything in between that depends on monocropping practices. Uh, couldn't do it otherwise. Needs the standardization within the agricultural process. So yeah, this is this is existential stuff. I mean, this is big stuff. Uh, 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 coming through, rolling through the system there. And uh, so we are mobilizing on the NGO, a, a group of NGOs, and, and uh, it really has to start with, we need to have a common song, song sheet here. You know, we need to have uh, a common understanding of what we're for, what we're against, and, and, and uh, cut through you know, so much information to help us do that. Um, Mark asked in the chat, uh, what's the name of the French initiative you were pointing to? It's the four per thousand initiative. If you type into the, uh, I'll, 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 link, I'll catch it. Thank you. Marc Antoine, did you want to jump in? Please. Um, there's so much uh, I'd like to reply to. Uh, first, chronologically, Michael, uh, I agree totally uh, that we need to have ways to connect. Uh, and some of that, there's a lot of simple solutions. There's a lot of complex solutions. Uh, I don't think the simple solutions totally, unfortunately, solve the problem because it would have been solved, <laughs> maybe. Um, there's the question of identity is being handled by the ID, but the, the W3C DID initiative. I don't think it solves all the problem, but it's already a huge step in that direction owning your identity matters. But the reality is there's been a huge incentive for companies to, for, for uh, social network companies to create your own identity on their network and to balkanize the networks maximally because of the network effect they gain therein. And I think there is no, not going to be any answer to that other than probably regulatory or being able to create a good unifying identity system that people subscribe to enough that it gains, you know, it gets, uh, the, the big players have no choice but to adopt it. But I, I don't know if that's possible. I, I think it's possible to create a kind of guerrilla uh, account unification system that's possible. And that's definitely something important and interesting, I think. And of course, then the next step, like people are the easy identity to merge. And as I keep saying, uh, then we need to go to concept identity, which is a really hard one. But that's my hobby horse. I'm going to host, I put it in the chat, I'm going to host a hyper knowledge seminar with these themes. And please come and doodle. I'd love to discuss that more with you. But I think the personal identity is part of that equation. And especially because at some point, you want to know who you're talking to and how connected to reality they are. And this is where what Klaus is saying is so profoundly important. Uh, there's amazing work by Tetlock on super forecasters and people who have a track record of making correct predictions. And, but that means even agreeing that the prediction was fulfilled. And in an age of not even being able to agree on facts, <laughs> it makes the uh, evaluation of uh, did that prediction turn out true or not, uh, another fraught thing. And I think that anything that helps establish a common ground of reality, I don't know if it was in this venue or another that I mentioned Project Starling uh, last week, I think it was, which is a project to help journalists put their pictures on the blockchain as they take them. So yes, I was at that point, at that point in place and time when I took that picture and creating the, um, establishing 
uh, a track record of pointers to reality. This is going to be extremely important going forward. Uh, the, what was that love question? Uh, I mentioned Project Starling. Uh, and guerrilla, okay, guerrilla what system? A guerrilla identity unification system. So that um, I, if, you know, it's, it's, it's something I had to solve in Idealoom where I was getting be, uh, people to contribute mostly through email, but at some point we were going to harvest from social media. And then I want to know that if you've put that remark on Facebook or on Twitter or on this or on that, it's the same person and it's in reply to the same person so that you can still know the common identity. So could I, and we all have these uh, informal hubs where we say, by the way, this is my Twitter, this is my this, this is my that. That's not proven, by the way. Can we make that proven, verified, and so on, so that we know the network of who am I globally, uh, and that we can start delegating. Like if I'm giving, you access to my Twitter feed, my giving you access to my Mastodon feed and so on. These are the kinds of uh, the, the, the Facebook won over the open web in part because people wanted a way to specify who can read this. And Facebook pretended to offer that, didn't of course, but pretended to offer that and that got a lot of people. Uh, and I think being able to do that in a, platform agnostic fashion is key to breaking out of the silos. Five months to be fixed. Anyway, that's got to be fixed. And it's it's fixable now. Like there are amazing initiatives from the W3C with uh, OCAP based on DID. It's amazing what's going on in that field. It's, it's doable. Thanks, Mark Anton. We've gone over our hour. I'm happy to, this is a juicy conversation, but we, you know, we usually um, have been limiting these calls to an hour. So open to proposals or questions or somebody who'd like to put a bow on this conversation. Mark? Um, Mark Antoine, I think you might know of Kalia Hamlin, Identity Woman, and the work that she's done, um, which uh, is, um, please, please just, you know, Google Identity Woman. Um, she has been a driver in the Bay Area and, and worldwide on um, uh, guerrilla guerrilla identity, just just straight on there. Um, uh, the thing I, I forgot to to bring up is for me this is something I'm trying to figure out, but basically the commodification of of the self um, that seems to you know, rub me the wrong way as, uh, and I wonder if it's my personality or you know, the way I was raised, who knows, but, but simply, you know, self as brand, self as branding. Um, I just, it's not uh, working for you. I can't play. It's you. not working for me. Yeah. I, it's, it's not I working. Mean, I, but it's working for, you know, influencers. It's working for, you know, Mark, certain kinds All your problems of... will be fixed if you just find an audio signature that represents you so that anytime we trip across you, we hear dun, 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 and we're like, oh, there's Carranza inside. <laughs> See how easy that is? Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know that I will solve this, but I'm certainly going to be, uh, um, uh adding it to my list of things i'm passionately confused about well and th like this branding thing is 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 confusing in so many ways uh, partly is the commercialization and consumerization of our lives the the ransacking of our identities the dumpster diving for our data uh the abuse of filling our worlds with messages and all that and yet we're moving into a world where full-time employment i think is melting I think corporations are highly motivated to get rid of FTEs. Corporations just do not want FTEs. They want a few very highly skilled humans who are still like making profits roll in, but everybody else can go away. And certainly they need fewer than 30 hours a week <clears throat> because then they can, you know, we can get rid of their benefits. 
Um, that's just happening all over the place. So we're moving into portfolio careers, I think. And to be a portfolio careerist, you have to have a personal brand. You've got to be known somehow and you've got to be found somehow. And what that means is unclear and, and itchy and cranky to a lot of us. And, and yeah, it's a weird, weird world for that. Stacey. Yeah, so I just want to speak to small groups because I came on here with that thought. And at least it's really become clear to me that there's an unpaid role that's missing that needs to be built in. And that would be, I don't know the best word for it, um, I don't know if it's a coach, an interpreter, a connector, a combination of all three, but, you know, I've been looking at, you know, the whole career path of coaches and even people that are charging large sums of money to coach people. And it just strikes me that it's the people that are in need that are having to pay. And that seems to be, you know, something that's wrong with our system as a whole, whereas I think the company should be providing that. So, you know, earlier on the call, I heard you talking about, you know, small groups, the perfect numbers of three and five, which to me fits in perfectly. Like if I were imagining it, I would see that role working for three separate teams of three. So it becomes something that, you know, let's say, I mean, how many of you on this call work better by talking out your thoughts? I would think half of you. Um, I just think that, you know, right now, the kind of role that I'm envisioning really either comes from volunteerism or compassion, you know, just taking time out for somebody that you like. And why are we devaluing that? Why isn't that a paid role? And one of the effects that that would have, because I'm not talking about one person, I'm talking about a group of people that have this role that maybe, you know, move from team to team that would also take, you know, like when Klaus mentioned the value he has, that's a value that gets developed by being part of all those small teams. And a computer is never going to be able to determine who can work well together. They might be able to determine who's working on the same thing, but not who's going to work better. And that's about it. <laughs> um, and just a small instance, Pete and I have a a long going conversation with which is like just little snippets here and there that I think we have a lot of agreement on about the need for matchmakers or or concierges or something like that who are cyborgs who have really great power tools at, at hand but who are the humans who say you know you ought to meet Stacy and Klaus right and, and, and those those little connections those recommendations matter a whole big bunch uh, inside of broader social systems. And those people are the butterflies and the connectors and the bridges across social networks who, who, who help make those, those connections as well. Um, Hank, do you wanna talk a little? Can I, can I just, I just wanna ask yeah. a question. Is there something that identifies those people? Because just the fact that there isn't, it, it's just not something that we normally think about is what I'm trying to say. So two things on that. One, I think it's a brand new role in the way you were saying, and I think we need to sort of foster that and describe it. Number two, if you actually single those people out and then reward them a lot, you screw them up. Like a lot of really good connectors and networkers are working quietly. They, they don't want fame. Fame, like, like attention will actually destroy them because then the people who really want to be networked will show up and book, you know, book their calendar, solve whatever. Imagine your, your, your bad scenario. But, but I think that really good connectors are just like quietly doing the thing. And it's a piece of what they do that, that we undervalue. So maybe just pointing out the value is good. But I'm not sure that like we could give them a whole bunch of Groot coins or something like that uh, as a result. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm I don't seeing know. it. I see, I see a big schism. I see the people you're talking about. And then I see the people that already have that, that are looking to capitalize on it even more. So there's a greed in there as well, I think, and just from what I'm looking at. Yeah, uh, Pete? Real, real quick, don't think of that role as unpaid or unpayable. Um, it's important to figure out how to, for lack of a better word in our capitalist society, monetize uh, that, that skill reward it. and re reward it, yeah. Um, and there are plenty of people who right now, I, the, you know, some of my networks are kind of uh, Silicon Valley style. Um, and 
Um, there are certainly hyperconnectors in Silicon Valley who, um, because of deal flow and connections and things like that, they're able to invest in, in things that turn into money and, and uh, um, they can do it with a light touch. They don't, they're not all greedy bastards. Um, some of them are actually very human, um, wonderful people doing um, the work of the world. Yeah, let, um, let me say something, if I may. I was going to uh, actually invite you to do so, Hank. Your time yeah. is perfect. Well, I put every, everyone in this call has their own hobby horse. So uh, uh, I put mine uh, again in the, in the chat. <clears throat> uh, my hobby horse, and uh, I've mentioned it uh, one or two times in these calls, and uh, Jerry knows this quite well. Uh, I think that groups like uh, OGM are ideally suited to fulfill the function of a distributed global lab, leveraging collective intelligence of the, the 100 or maybe 200 members of the OGM community to address grand societal challenges. Not that that's the only thing OGM should do, but it's one thing that OGM is ideally suited for. And what you add, I'm talking about this type of uh, hobby, dream, uh, passion of mine with other uh, knowledge uh, driven and co-creating groups like the World Future Studies Federation and the New Club of Paris and, and whatever. But the thing that you, are ideally suited to do is bring in these cutting edge technologies that can amaze people. And whether experts like, like Peter or Marc Antoine or, or so would say, well, they're not really cutting edge. To me and the people like myself, they are totally amazing. Every time I sit and listen to one of these calls, I'm totally amazed at how much can be done is being done by so many people. And also addressing Stacy, of course, who coined the word for me, the muggles. Uh, the world is full of 98% muggles who will just like me be totally amazed by the ways that the people in OGM should a group of people want to really be able to help with, and I mean, my, my idea is helping with uh, those very complex and, well, complex, sometimes chaotic issues behind the 17 SDGs. And uh, Klaus is already doing that and addressing some of them and probably other people on, I don't know about this call, but I know David Boville is doing it, Mark Drexler is doing it. And I know about 15 or 18 people in OGM. And everyone seems to want to do something like that. And we've talked a lot before about prototyping and learning by doing, both in this call and Free Jerry's Brain call. And I would really think we should see, Jerry has this weaving the world. Uh, and I th did you have four or six shows you want to do? And let's put something out there through weaving the world, which everyone will say, wow, I want more of that. Um, so that's 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 my uh, my hobby horse uh, for today. <laughs> so Hank, wow, and thank you. And I was going to reply to you by saying, <clears throat> I think this is sort of exactly the intention of weaving the world, which is feeding the big fungus, which is also feeding uh, our, our, our geek community, which is building tiles or pieces. Uh, that solve the larger puzzle of this shared intelligence thing. And I, I think that that dynamic is, is a laboratory or a sandbox or whatever you want to call it, sort of as a whole, taken as a whole. And I'm eager to get moving and we repurposed the Wednesday call to be the, from Generative Commons to be the uh, uh, Weaving the World Operations. So if you want to help design this and, and so forth, uh, tomorrow at seven is, is like, we're going to head into that conversation. <clears throat> and I've got a bunch of documents. I've got a project plan uh, working, which I'll share in the channel that I created for Weaving the World. And I think I really want us to get off and running. And the funding I have is to stand up six episodes of Weaving the World, plus uh, public uh, publishing of my annotations in the brain of those calls and you know the weaving artifacts uh, afterward. And some 
uh, and two um, funding two projects uh, that build pieces of those tiles, one of which is very likely to be um, something that I think Pete is central to, which is how do we automate some of the workflow of processing a call, right? I, I get I get a note after calls like this, today it's gonna go to Pete because thank you for using your, your room. But after all the calls like this, I get an email that says, hey, your recording is ready, uh, go here to download it. And then I do a bunch of manual stuff, which I and lots of other people doing lots of calls like this would love to automate as much of, as possible away. So that would be a little tile in the middle of how do we build artifacts that we put in the, in the, on the fungus, in the commons. And then lather, rinse, repeat uh, on toward, uh, I think more um, deeper, more provocative challenges, like what role does machine learning have with, with this fungus? Like, like how do we actually make those connections? Who do we invite in? Uh, how do we build the lab so that other people's labs fit very nicely into our work and us into theirs uh, so that we start to realize that we're working on the same damned artifact? Right? And the big fungus is merely uh, one funny way, tongue in cheek way of describing the commons between us, which is the thing we're trying to, to nurture. So yes, on all fronts, Hank. Yeah. And I think we're getting to the point where it's gonna turn into action. If you think of a show and some projects under it as action enough. Yeah, yeah my, my idea is you, you make one big bang first impression and then uh, then you see what happens and then that, that's what you go for. So I would think any kind of action like that, which either either is addressed to the geek community or the model community or whatever community they are addressed to should be a real big bang. And, and I'd love, love to address the, the issues. Unfortunately, I can't join tomorrow uh, because seven in the morning at your time is still uh, six to seven, uh, four to five here. And often people want that at the end of their work day in Europe for another thing, but I will definitely join it. Cool. I just wanna make one other message, which I think I did tell Jerry, but I'm not the others. Uh, at the end of the month, there's going to be a uh, international conference in Berlin and I'm, taking the risk of going to a real potential COVID spreader. Uh, it's for the World Future Studies uh, Federation. And I'm going to present a 90 minute workshop, which will be live streamed about how that organization, which is uh, an, an, an international knowledge, uh, management knowledge creation, based on the future and future studies, uh, how that organization could become a distributed global lab for addressing SDGs. And before I go, and I'll be leaving on 22nd, so I'd like to have some conversations with this group and, uh, uh, and the Free Jerry's Brain Group, in which way can I also mention OGM as being, starting to want to do that as well. So, I mean, it's not a question for now, it's a question that uh, I'd, I'd like to have an answer to in about two, two or two and a half weeks. I don't have to mention OGM, but I think it'd be nice to mention OGM because I think everyone needs to know the global mind. <laughs> Absolutely, Hank. And yeah. let's figure this out so that you can say something that makes sense and is consistent. <clears throat> um, and, I, and I wanna cross this with, one of the big important questions for the, the six, six episodes that'll start uh, weaving the world is what topics and what guests to cover. Uh, really, really important. And not that they need to be famous. I'm totally not looking for marquee names. Uh, they need to be thoughtful and they need to be woven into the kinds of things that we're doing. So Klaus, if you wanna think about for the Farm Bill project, like I would love to frame a call or several around that and, and, and figure out like, who, who does that mean we bring into the conversation? What do we do? And can we leave behind for you an artifact that is useful for your work in that project, for example? Um, uh, and, and Hank, you know, uh, maybe there's something that we weave in for the, for the future society, I don't know. And, 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 and again, one of the goals here is to not be talking to white men all the time. And so how do we um, serve the underserved and make part of our path, our early path, um, clearly into other communities that, that uh, uh, don't normally get the attention that they merit or, or whatever else. So um, 
all those things are, are, are really hot on the table for me right now. And we'll be talking about them tomorrow during the planning call and also on the channel. Join the Weaving the World channel uh, on the Mattermost, which I think is where we'll, we'll focus a lot of this conversation. Actually, sorry, there's two different channels I created for Weaving the World. One of them is, I, is what I'm thinking about as the public chat channel for Weaving the World. So any, any person who comes in and is interested, if they ask, say, how can we talk more about this? I would route them to the Weaving the World channel on the Mattermost. Then there's a WTW Ops channel which is really where we talk about what calls to have, what, how to structure this thing, all that. So, so I would join both channels and the ops channel is where we should have conversations about the structure and path uh, and making of uh, the building of, of weaving the world. Does that make sense? I don't see weaving the world on the, on the uh, channel. Uh, if, you, if you go down under public channels and search for them, uh, it should be there. I, we can also easily put links in the chat here. Um, Sorry, Klaus. do public channels and then more, more at the bottom. Yeah, uh, more at the bottom of the public channels. That's the oh, way. To, that's the way to add more channels. And there you'll see all the other public channels on this server that you could join. And you can join Weaving the World and WTW Ops. And if you feel like it, the big fungus, which I've got to figure out what this what this spread of um, conversation is between the Weaving the World and the big fungus. But I think let's 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 go WTW Ops in it for now for figuring this out together. Can I say one more thing before we leave? No, I mean, of course. <laughs> this is this is really hard to say in a room full of white men because the first response is th that's not professional. But when I was talking about that role, included in it is one of nurture. And I just wanted to say that. <laughs> thank <Love> you. That. <laughs> thank, thank you, Stacey. And you also pointed out that my language around people not like around not white men wasn't very good. And, and I think you preferred people not like me or like what, what's a, what's a, what's an, a delicate and, and like legitimate and respectful way to say, trying not to just go have a grand tour of white men's brilliant thinking. People who look differently, cause that could, you know, cover clothing, hair cause style. They're, cause they're gonna think a lot like us, I hope. Like, like I'm looking, I'm not looking to find, I'm not looking for Richard Spencer to be my guest on a show, certainly not right off the bat and figure out how I can get like a Nazi to, to download his belief system. Down the road, interesting. Like, like I'm not, that's not outside my, my scope. Um, but up front, it's gonna be people who think like us, but don't look like us. I think maybe that's the, uh, some, some piece of it. I, I mean, I, I like trying not to other people or or to other the the majority person. So the way one of the ways I say it, and it's hard to pull off, but regular people or normal people, not like me. <laughs> people who are normal, not white, not men, not you know. But, but normal doesn't carry that valence for most people. I I know, it, yeah. it's a, a hard thing, so so yeah. regular is okay. sometimes okay. Regular means they poop regularly. Diverse, diverse. I like diverse. I like diverse. <laughs> Diversity is holding that holding that weight these days. I mean that that's happening. Yeah. It's and one, more, one more thing to to Klaus, since we're talking about differences, because I I'm going to other for a minute, and by other I'm going to talk about people that are against vaccinations. I could really see them being a great ally in some of the work you're doing because they're real, a lot of them are really focused on the immune system and you know they're anti corporations and you know that's where i think we need to do a little bit more networking totally yeah. and 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 a word i really like in that kind of conversation is complexify um, which adam grant puts in uh, in one of his recent books and he basically says that these things aren't just binary, it's not just yes or no, and there's not that like a whole package yes or, that you're voting yes or no against. All these issues are really complicated. And I, you know, there's a whole bunch of problems I have with how corporate structures and, you know, the C corporation works in the world today, which I think we would agree violently with lots of those people on. So part of it is as we dissolve and complexify the issues, we'll find points of agreement and disagreement. And then I don't really know when we get to impasses, which we're going to get to, um, uh, what we'll do. Like, I, I don't really know. I think that like listening deeply and having respect and hearing people out is going to matter a bunch, but uh, we'll, get, we'll get to some really uncomfortable places, I think, and that's okay. There, there are certain pinch points where 
that help you to go underneath the radar, underneath the, the defenses. So for example, one thing that we identified uh, in the, uh, the, the, the food discussion is the idea that the biome, the microbiome in the soil mirrors the, uh, or that your personal gut by microbiome mirrors that of the soil where your food is coming from. So the, this linkage, right? So the, the chemicals that are being put on the, onto the field don't have a direct impact on your muscular system, but they do impact your microbiome, which then in turn creates all kinds of pathologies. Women in particular instantly relate to this, right? And then the idea that you have 20% uh, uh, of American women have glyphosate in their breast milk. I mean, things like this resonate, you know? And so by, by, uh, by, by structuring the information, the conversation around things that are purely emotional, deeply personal, right? Then you can go and offer uh, some, some solutions. Love that. Thank you, Klaus. Makes a lot of sense. I watched a documentary years ago about um, uh, endocrine disruptors in our system, <clears throat> in the water system, you know, plastics, chemicals, other sorts of things, pesticides. And it was just shocking. And part of it was like early onset of puberty, like, like that's really changing. Uh, there's, there's just all kinds of stuff happening all over the place that, we're, that we've been busy doing to ourselves. Um, cool, well, we've gone a half hour over, like just like that, boom. Um, so I think it's probably a good moment to wrap this call. Uh, I thank you all greatly. See some of you on the call tomorrow and on the inner tubes and uh, uh, too bad Facebook isn't down for another day, but uh, <laughs> yeah. See you. See you later. See you. I'll see you, Peter, at the uh, uh, Wednesday wiki today. Awesome. See you there. Bye-bye. Right. Saving chat. Saved. Bye.